Hola, comrades. Today's topic of interest, Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door. Let me ask you a question. What is humor? What makes something funny? This is a question that has beleaguered comedians for millennia. It's hard to contrive one definitive answer, but the closest I can muster is this. Good humor adds to the world, but in a wacky, unexpected manner. This is as opposed to good drama, which adds to the world in a more straightforward, expected manner. Bad humor and bad drama both only seek to destroy identities, not build them. If a batter steps up to the plate with two strikes and two outs and hits a home run, that's drama. If they hit instead a foul ball off the left field post, that's comedy. If they hit the ball and it bounces off the left field post and goes into the stands for a home run, that's both, and it's brilliant. Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door, is the left field post home run of gaming. Let's face it, most attempts to add humor in video games leave the gamer laughing like this. <laughs> That's my favorite game ever, by the way. <laughs> you really should play it sometime. But back to humor. Why are games so bad at humor? It's gotten to the point where the two options for games when it comes to humor are A, not included at all, which in the wrong hands can lead to these tired, pretentious games that pretend to be deep ruminations, but are in reality just wish-fulfillment fantasies for the hot topic crowd, and B, include it in a puerile, vapid, and mindless way that would cause the makers of Shrek to say, okay guys, grow up a little. And that's terrible, because good humor can be a great boon to storytelling. A lot of my favorite movies of the last 20 years, from Little Miss Sunshine, to 500 Days of Summer, to Before Midnight, despite tackling serious topics, can be remarkably funny. Or take some of the best TV shows of all time, like Breaking Bad or Mad Men, there, drama is not only at peace with humor, but amplified by it. Now, obviously, humor is not absolutely necessary in every work. The Americans, for example, does well without much humor, and so does something like The Last of Us. But even that show and that game have moments of lightness to undercut their themes of death, isolation, desolation, loss of innocence, and hopelessness. I'm not much of a fan of Robert Heinlein's iconic novel, Stranger in a Strange Land, but one thing it gets absolutely right is how human it is to laugh. How laughter is one of the highest and most fundamental tenets of humanity. You don't need the audience to be rolling on the floor belly laughing. Just have a character crack a joke or play a game when everything seems darkest. It can take the stress off not only them, but also the player. Make the player smile or smirk as they prepare to head into the deepest depths of the game. That does not mean there's not value in getting your audience to be belly laughing across the floor. Final Fantasy games are very serious, but they avoid becoming pretentious, self-serious, and impossibly, undeservedly grandiose by their focus on humanity and character and that often involves humor. There are more serious entries in the series, such as Final Fantasy X, and less serious entries, such as V and X2, but they all use their humor to not just immerse the audience in the world, but to establish and expand the world itself. A fictional world is nothing without the emotional connections between it and the audience. Without those connections, the world may as well not exist. It is by those connections that it is able to seem real, more real at times than actual reality. And how are those connections established? By human interactions between characters and between the characters and the environment, that's how. By those interactions, a world not only becomes more immersive, its very spirit is enhanced and cultivated. 
All that philosophical rambling leads us to Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door. Final Fantasy can be funny. This game just is funny. Playing this adventure, you do a lot less of this. and a lot more of this. <laughs> I cannot think of a single game that made me laugh harder and more consistently, but far from sacrificing the integrity of the sprawling storyline, the humor expands and enhances it. Mario RPGs have tended to be on the silly side ever since Legend of the Seven Stars on the SNES, but that tendency amounted to tradition with the two big Mario RPG series running today, Paper Mario and Mario and Luigi. One of the reasons for the drift toward humor is that when you get right down to it, Mario is an inherently silly series. It's a Japanese gaming series starring a fat Italian plumber who eats mushrooms to grow bigger, collects giant golden coins, uses tiny stars with eyes to become invincible, and stomps on the heads of turtles and little mushroom creatures on his way to save the human princess of a kingdom of mushroom people from a giant turtle who captured her for vaguely defined reasons. A flower allows him to shoot fireballs, and a different flower allows him to shoot snowballs. He rides on top of a green dinosaur and dresses in bright red. In his journeys, he's been to space, cleaned up an island resort, saved Princess Peach innumerable times, been captured by ghosts, and saved by his cowardly green-clothed brother, Luigi been a doctor, a carpenter, an archaeologist, a construction worker, and just about every kind of athlete. Basketball, soccer, hockey, kart racing, you name it. He has also competed with a spiny blue hedgehog in the Olympic Games and partied like mad, playing all sorts of minigames, even attending a party thrown by Bowser in Mario Party DS. This despite that Bowser has been his arch nemesis in practically every Mario game, except when he isn't, and he and Bowser are chummy enough to go karting together or play a tennis match with one another. You see what I mean? It's insanity, and even if you pared the list down to include only the core Mario games, you have a lot of bizarre stuff to contend with. Trying to make an RPG in the vein of Final Fantasy or Tales would inevitably fail, so instead of playing down the franchise's silliness, these RPGs embrace it and use it to their advantage. They use it to be creative and inventive. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, one of the greatest games in the entire Mario franchise, does this best. For the unaware, Paper Mario is exactly what its name suggests. A franchise where Mario and the world around him are made of paper. Before it became a tired gimmick by the bland fourth game in the series, Sticker Star, this allowed for a lot of creative mechanics. The one which stands out most to me also offers a fine example of the game's humor. In the sewers of a town called Rogueport, as its name suggests, it is a rundown town of thieves and scoundrels, quite unexpected for a Mario game and a stark shift from the unfailingly colorful aesthetic of the original Paper Mario, the clearing off the bat that this game will take more risks than its predecessor. But in the series of Rogueport, there is a dark, ominous-looking chest. To open it, you need a black key. Now, we've all seen this trope before. There might as well be a warning sign saying, Don't open me, I'm a bad chest. If this were a horror movie, we'd be screaming at the screen for the protagonist not to do something stupid, and then they'd go and do it anyway and we'd facepalm in dismay. But in a game, it's not like that. We're the protagonist. We have to go and fall into the obvious trap or else we can't progress. And of course, the trope about evil treasure chests goes back even farther to early RPGs from the 80s and early 90s where you did not have to trigger the trap, but the trap wasn't obvious. You just walked up to a treasure chest expecting it to offer you something good and instead it attacked you and you had to fight it. What we see in Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door is in many ways an inverse of that. You're expecting something vile to emerge from the ominous chest, but that's not exactly what transpires. Well, 
kinda. A menacing looking figure of darkness does in fact emerge from the chest, but there's a twist. They want to be evil, but the supposed curse they put on you really gives you new powers, powers without which you could not progress in the game. The figure, believing it has done its evil duty, calls you a fool before leaving you to your adventure. This is one of the first outright hilarious moments in the game. There had been funny lines and sequences before, but this is a cut above, and the best thing about about it is how it becomes a recurring joke. What's unique about gaming as an art form is that it needs to tie your direct physical involvement with the game, meaning the gameplay, with the indirect evocative involvement, meaning the story and the characters, together. Humor informs on character and story, so it is included in this, and once that is accepted, you can see what's genius about this. Mario needs these new forms, meaning the ability to transform into a paper plane or a paper boat, or something of the like, to progress, so the game needs some way of introducing them throughout the story without taking the player out of their experience, so this was their solution and it's a pretty good one at that. You're not unaware that you, the player, are being given a tutorial, but because you're laughing so hard, you don't care. The unpleasantness of being given tutorials emerges from you, the player, being taken out of the game, out of the immersion. So if the tutorial is given in a way that, because of its humor, doesn't just leave the player in the game, but furthers their connection with it, the player does not have a problem the harm is diffused. This becoming a running joke ties the story together. Being an adventure game, the Thousand Year Door requires you to travel to distant lands, and may I add that these lands are as gorgeous as they are diverse. One chapter leads you to a photo-negative forest, another to a giant fighting pit in the sky. It's so easy to get wrapped up in these worlds as you traverse through them to collect crystal stars that you forget on some level that they're connected. But running jokes, which evoke an instant reaction in you upon recognition, jog your memory, make it easier for you to see the big picture. And what's great is how Mario, never the most personable character, reacts to this. As the gag repeats, he goes from being first frightened and then pleased to being detached and bored. Get the spiel over with and give me the cool new power, his body language seems to say. Of course, Mario interacts physically with a far more menacing aspect of the game that nonetheless manages to be a tool of humor. The villains, they are called the x knots and they are the perfect villains for a game like this. From their names, to their surfer do dialogue, to their uniforms, to their having a base on the moon, there's a lot of humor inherent in these guys, but what I like most about them is how they are throwbacks in nearly every way to cheesy B-movie sci-fi minions from the 1950s. With the possible exception of their dialogue, though if the minions of those old B-movies did have character beyond obsequious grunt number 548 and were given flavorful lines of dialogue, they they usually were rather wacky. And who is the leader of this crew? Sir Grotus, another strangely named character with a stranger design. I mean, look at this guy. We can see inside his dome of a head that he's a robot or cyborg of some sort, but he has a regal cape complete with collar and also a scepter that seems to have mechanical components. If the x knots are 50s B-movie sci-fi Hanksman, then he is the 50s B-movie sci-fi evil overlord. And that's not even getting to his second in command, who is named Lord Crump and fights you twice in mechas that look like they were built from paper. In Super Paper Mario, the most humorous of the villains, Francis, is aside from being a chameleon the exact stereotype of the socially inept nerd, and he is the total geek. He has in his collection every piece of nerd merch you could possibly imagine. And he is obsessed with shows about the x knots and Sir Grotus. In Super Paper Mario, it appears that these villains have been turned into these cheesy sci-fi movie characters. Which, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> 
As for the more traditional villain of Mario, King Bowser of the Koopas, he is mostly relegated to a side role, but it is admittedly an incredibly entertaining side role. You get to play as him after almost every chapter, and he is a hapless villain, always a step behind. He wants the Crystal Stars, and as usual, he wants to capture Princess Peach, but he can do neither. He is also an utter ham. Bowser in the mainline Mario games is mostly just, Wahaha, I'm so evil, let me roar and breathe fire and capture the princess. I'm Bowser, I stomp around and smash things. But Bowser in Mario RPGs, and here I mean both in Paper Mario and Mario and Luigi, is more complicated. He is something of a buffoon, but he is both formidable and relatable. This is the case when he is not the main villain of the game, and is instead a side character or protagonist. In the Thousand Year Door, he is both. The levels in which you control Bowser are brilliant examples of comedy inherent in game design. You're playing through old Mario Bros. levels, so the expectation is set, but that expectation is then subverted, not only because you're playing through them as the Koopa King, the monolithic villain of these early games, but also because you're playing through them in a way that demands sheer raw power, rather than the finesse that the levels as originally designed required. So what does this amount to? What we have in Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door is a game that goes beyond mere parody, that mocks convention and trope, not just for mocking's sake, and not just to put the fake that's being mocked in contrast with the real of the game's main storyline, but rather to directly further the player's experience with the narrative. The mocking is, in of itself, a constructor of the game's world and an instrument by which that world evokes emotion in the player. And that is interesting. I can't think of another game that's done that as successfully. What I'm trying to say is that the humor is never tangential to the overall experience, but rather a primary agent of it. There is so much humor in this game that I never got a chance to dissect. From Goombella's catalogs to Flavio and Duplis to Luigi's concurrent adventures that may or may not be partially made up. But that's sort of the point. This very much is an entire world of humor, a world built out of jokes and humorous character interactions. They're integral to the essence of the experience, not only helping contrast with the more serious topics about world destruction and all that jazz, but helping build to them. A world of humor. In this dark world we all live in, what could be more wonderful? This was a longer one. I never realized I had so much to say about this game. That's the great thing about these analyses. You never know exactly what they're going to be until you write them out. Anyway, if you liked what you saw today, consider donating to my Patreon so I can produce more gorgeous content. Also, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that amazing stuff. Adios, comrades!